It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Tuesday, November the 2nd, 2023. Not 1969, but 2023. And I make that distinction because in about three hours, there's going to be a new Beatles single released to the world. Uh, it will immediately race to the top of the charts in dozens of countries in the year 2023 because the Beatles are still the Beatles after all these years. Uh, but, uh, wow, now and then uh, coming out. I mean, it's it's kind of, we heard about this song in August, maybe even late July. Mm -hmm. It was announced. Right. Oh, by the way, we've got a new song. We found an old tape from Jones, and we're going to put it out this fall. And so we've had a few months to process that fact. Today is the day that this comes out. In a moment, uh, throughout the day, we're going to be sharing some clips. They There was a 12-minute video that the Beatles, again, it's so funny to think of them as a ba the Beatles released yesterday, <laughs> right. uh, explaining the process of how this song came to be. Long story short, John Lennon recorded some songs that he had written in 1960. 79 and 1980 into a cassette player like an old school just a, a cassette tape him at the piano and singing and they sound like a cassette tape from 1979 would sound which is just kind of echoey uh, you can hear his voice very clearly but you can hear the piano very loudly and Peter Jackson, who directed the Get Back documentary, and Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr finally pulled this one last song out called Now and Then, and they were able to separate the vocal. After all these years, technology allowed them to pull the piano away from John's vocal, and then they could build a track around it. And that is how we end up in 2023 with a Beatles single. And something hit me yesterday that really kind of blew my mind, okay? Now, we heard about this in late July, right? Mm -hmm. And they said then... By the first word we heard, if you remember, was it'll be out by the end of September. That's what we all heard. And then yeah. there was like, no, it's not. And then we're like, wait, it's October. When's it coming? When's it coming? And now it's not till November 2nd. Think back, all rock history fans, to the 60s. How many times have you heard Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger tell the story of back in the day when they had a new single, the two camps would phone each other to say, when are you putting out your next single? will wait because they didn't want to compete with each other for the oh. number one pop start place on the charts. Mm. <laughs> the Beatles and the Stones in 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, look at the release date on their singles. They're always staggered. They did. They never, like the Beatles literally waited on Hey Jude till Jumpin' Jack Flash was out of the way and vice versa over years. But who goes well, first? Isn't it kind well, of like a Mexican it, standoff? I, no, it was always released? just it was just who's got one in who's got one locked and loaded and ready to go. And so what happened last month? The Rolling Stones put out Hackney Diamonds. They mm -hmm. had a two month campaign. They got all the world's attention. And the Beatles are like, I, I I just I don't know this, but I know it. Paul McCartney saw that coming and went, Oh wait, hang on. Let them have their minute, <laughs> and then right. and then we'll come Makes back sense. in and remind everyone that we're still all caps. The Beatles, <laughs> I think, uh, that with just one song, but still yeah. they're getting as much. They'll get as much attention for this song as the Stones get for the oh, album. Yeah. And I, I'm willing to bet my last dollar that that is just the old things. You know, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. The the Beatles realized, wait, we can't go up against the Stones. This is mm -hmm. silly. It'll hurt both of us. Yeah, right. Well, I think it, it, it might have had a chance to get it out before the Stones, if by the end of September with the Stones release in you know October 20th the album came out of but course they the, did that thing before that but yeah they were the Stones were already doing they were dropping their little hints and they had I the know. website you know they they had their build up so that they were just like yeah, you guys take the whole two months we'll come in my after. point is at no point would Paul McCartney have ever done this before the Stones I mean, no. it, this always had to come after the yep. Stones release for him because you're right. Oh, that's good. You're a great new album. And listen, Paul McCartney was recording with Andrew Watt. I was. I made a joke last week that Andrew Watts, uh, the producer of the Hackney, Hackney Diamonds new Stones album, mm -hmm. I said, oh, you know what? Let, why don't you get Paul McCartney in there and start recording with him? He seems to have reinvented it. Put some new vigor, some piss and vinegar into the Rolling Stones. Right. It sounds so right. fantastic. It turns out that he is was recording with Paul McCartney 
Now, there was an article the way he was talking that he had to finish up the Stones album, and uh, Mick Jagger called him up and said, yeah, Andrew, we're going to be in New York City, wanted to uh, finish up a recording with you, and he said, oh, this is really awkward, but I'm recording with Paul McCartney. Yeah. He says, oh, all right, finish up with Paul, mm -hmm. and then come join us. So there's some new Paul music coming from that producer sure. that put the Hackney Diamonds together, so you're right, they're, they're watching each other's moves every step of the way, and the most exciting new music to come out in 2023 is from... The Stones and the Beatles. Hello, pretty, pretty incredible <laughs> to, to to really think about. Yeah. Um, we we've got we've got some. We can yeah. play a little bit of the Peter Jackson video for you. I will just say this in advance. I watched this yesterday afternoon when it hit the internet, uh, as one does. And there's a moment when you get that voice that you haven't heard something new from in 40 years. Yeah. And it just sent a chill up my spine, and it was very emotional. And this is not just as a lifelong Beatles fan, yeah. but just as a fan of music in general and of rock and roll music especially, I will put John Lennon as the greatest rock singer up next to anybody. I mean, just anytime you want to put on Twist and Shout and say whoever topped that, feel free to give me your suggestions. <laughs> yeah. uh, hearing John Lennon's voice again after all these years, it was like a, um, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, it's like, I don't know. It's like if somebody said, here's George Washington giving a comment, uh, his <laughs> inauguration speech. Right. We never had it till now. Yeah. It really just shook me to my core in a great way. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. Thursday, November 2nd, uh, two and a half hours from now, a new single will be released by a band from Liverpool, England. They're called The Beatles. Keep an ear out for them. They're going to make it, kids. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. I would imagine um, back in the day... Uh, Mike Evans has spent a little time uh, with some Beatles records. It's time for the Mike Evans Hollywood Report. Michael, Beatles fan, yes or no? Oh, absolutely. Attaboy. A a ab ab absolutely. Uh, uh, way, way back. Uh, way back. I'm 17 years old um, and working as a gopher and emptying trash at uh, Carol A in Los Angeles. And Bob Eubanks. From the newlywed game. Let's bring out the wives to see if they predicted <laughs> what you'd say. That's exactly. Really cool. uh, Bob Eubanks was doing <laughs> afternoons, and Rev Foster was doing uh, nights, and um, they told me and some other people's kids that worked at the, we're going to need you for the next week. Uh, you're going to be our gophers. You're going to just do, do whatever you're told. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, why? What's happening? Uh, they promoted the Beatles coming to Los Angeles. There you the go. Time. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hollywood Love Bowl or bust. So uh, this is a report brought to you by Marcus Theaters, uh, and I got an early movie review for you today, and it'll be at Marcus Theaters. But first, and I love this because Steve is so tapped into sports, uh, Texas Rangers world champions, first time ever, picked them in five, they won in five. Did you watch much of the series? Only took them 63 years. No, I, I didn't, actually. I, I watched the highlights. I had it on each night for a few minutes, but the truth is I just couldn't bring myself to care. He, Steve is... <laughs> He's a big sports guy, so he'll, he'll, he'll know this. But for all you other folks, pop quiz, where did the Rangers play before they moved to Dallas? Where, you mean, oh, you mean where, where did they come from? Yes. I, uh, yeah, I do know, and I can't even think about it. Um, Washington uh, Senators. Yeah, the Senators, of course. Yeah. And the last manager of the Senators before they moved that, that year was Ted Williams. Really? Right yeah. Wow, I don't um, think I knew that. Bobby Knight, arguably the most colorful coach in American sports, has died, and uh, I love it. I mean, I love it. During his retirement uh, comments, Bobby said those famous words, when my time is gone here and my activities here are past, mm -hmm. I want they bury me upside down and my critics can kiss my ass. Um, Eloquent. <laughs> yeah. Okay then, Bob. Yeah, great, great coach. Uh, a yeah. very mixed, uh, a mixed blessing uh, working with Bob Knight, I'm sure. For but the players loved him, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all that matters. There you go. Hey, uh, early movie review. Uh, it'll be playing at uh, at Marcus Priscilla. You know what, Steve? This was surprisingly a good movie. I'm, I, I'm not surprised. I think Sofia Coppola is great. Uh, as, especially, uh, you'll love it, especially if you're interested in a love story that happened 55 years ago and a superstar who falls in love with a 14-year-old child. Mm. I know it sounds a little odd. The story is from Priscilla's point of view. Uh, they met in 1959. They married in 1967. They divorced six years later in 1973 and with a lot of innocence and deception mm -hmm. involved. 
Uh, Kaylee Spaini, who plays Priscilla, is fabulous. Writer, director, producer, you said it, Sofia Coppola, is great. 90 minutes, three stars. Quick sidebar. Sophia, Nick Cage's cousin, of course, and Sophia's very first acting role. Do you know what it was? She was uh, she was Godfather. in the first Godfather, Second. was she not? No, the she third. The no, third. as a baby, she's <laughs> no. in the first Godfather. Oh, you're right. I forgot about that. Baby. It was when she was two months old and was baptized in the Godfather. Yep. Uh, cast, of course, by her dad, Francis Ford. Yeah, that's that's uh, pretty great. Pretty great uh, introduction to the world as Michael's <laughs> whacking the heads so. of all the other families. <laughs> I would say so. She'll be in this business. Los Angeles has raised the prices for studios to shoot TV and movies when they go and shoot remote. All applications, permits, drone usage, helicopters, street closures, simulated gunfire parking, everything has gone way, way up. L.A. has become very unfriendly to the industry that made them. And a lot of studios are saying that they're going to start going to uh, to Vancouver more, to Albuquerque more, and do less remote shooting in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oz and Inns' Danny Elfman agreed to pay $800,000 in a sexual harassment suit it is now being re-sued for failing to pay the total amount. Uh, I barely got to know Danny when he had the L.A. Garage Band Oingo Boingo before mm-hmm. they were a hit. Yeah. Uh, he went on, of course, to write scores for over 100 movies, married Bridget Fonda uh, 20 years ago. Nice guy, but a little odd. Well, yeah. Got to Danny a little odd. Uh, Bruce Springsteen's peptic ulcer is more serious than we've heard. We wish him the best. And I don't know about you, but... I used to watch the news between affiliates uh, calling every morning, but they become news has become so depressing. Now I watch Leave It to Beaver and Andy Griffith. Wow, you, you've had enough news for one lifetime, Mike. Kick back, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy Lumpy Rutherford. Again. I can't watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, what's going on in Minneapolis? Uh, no. Yeah, a little cold, a little dark. Um, and, uh, you know, we're setting the clocks back so because we don't want to see that sun till 10 a.m. for the winter. So, you know, we're getting ready. We're, bur- <laughs> we're burrowing in. <laughs> so, let me ask you something. What, what is the general feeling now that Cousins is gone? Um, it's, it's, well, it's business as usual for long suffering Vikings fans. I mean, I think <laughs> the only people not surprised were, were Vikings fans. Everyone else was like, oh my God, poor Kirk. And it seems like a lot of Vikings fans were like, yeah, I yeah, thought no. that was coming. Oh, yeah. there he goes. Yeah. They were looking so good too. Long time. He was having a hell of a season. There's he no was. doubt about it. Uh, hey guys, have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See ya. See ya, Mike. Um, Boy, I, I knew I knew Evans had a Beatles something in there back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Beatles' first trip to L.A. when they played the Hollywood Bowl in 1964, uh, they famously stayed at a house like in Bel Air, which is the Beverly Hills of Beverly Hills. Bel Air is like even more exclusive. And some giant producer gave them his estate on the top of a hill. And... Uh, and that's where they they just all in one house. I mean, it's, it's so funny to think that the Beatles were on tour in 1964 and 65 and 66. And at no time did they get four hotel rooms. They always had two. They right. shared rooms oh. forever. They had giant suites and stuff, but there would always be two guys in a room. And when they were in L.A. to play the Hollywood Bowl, they were all staying at a giant guy, at a guy's house together because they get a more. There was no hotel that could guarantee security and their safety from the uh-huh. fans. And there were helicopters flying over the house, not news helicopters, privately chartered helicopters from fans who could afford them, <laughs> just trying to get a look Jeez. at the guys hanging out by the pool. Oh. Where to sleep in bunk beds. Um, oh, jeez. Can you imagine? Hey, we will, well, you know, we, were, we grew up in a van, and we were used to that, and we'd eat beans from a can, and then we were in L.A., and then we had sushi. It was something. Yeah, I mean. People are chartering the, helicopters to see if you step outside and yawn in the morning. Of all the whirlwinds, man, they still, I, I don't know, man. I mean, Justin Bieber ain't got nothing on those guys. I can tell you that right now. Right now, why don't we look back? Appreciate a guy who knows his history. Well, you've come to the right place. Steve, what's <laughs> happening? I'll tell you what's happening, man. <laughs> it's November 2nd. On this day in 1969, Gordie Howe scored his 19th and final hat trick as the Red Wings beat the Penguins 4-2. to 
In 1969, Gordy Howe uh, became the oldest man to ever do that in the NHL. He was 41. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. He was already 41 in 1969. The guy played uh, for many, many more years. Of course, he played alongside not one but two yeah. of his own sons in the NHL. Uh, this was an actual hat trick where he scored three goals. This was not a Gordy Howe hat trick. As you know, for years, the Gordie Howe hat trick was a goal, an assist, and a fight all in the same game. <laughs> and never wore a helmet, I don't believe. <laughs> oh, heck. No. What, are you kidding? Uh, he'd rather, like, chew batteries than put on a helmet. <laughs> in 1990, for the first time ever, the Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, hosted a regular season basketball game. The Timberwolves debuted on this day 33 years ago. If you had said to me, when did the Timberwolves kick off, I would have said... 94, 95, I would yeah. have, in my head, I would have put it closer to Garnett's arrival. Uh, I was like, oh, yeah, they were there in 1990. Tony Campbell led the way with 24 points in a victory over the Dallas Mavs. Tony Campbell, remember that name? It's been a while. Pooh Richardson. Yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> your uh, Ty right. Corbin. Uh, <laughs> I believe uh, Dennis Felton was a part of that team as well. <laughs> the kid from Louisville who would sit on the bench in college with a stuffed animal. Oh, what, what kind of stuffed animal? Thing. I, I don't know. I just I was you see a seven a footer with a stuffed animal. You're yeah. gonna remember that. Oh. It's the KQ Morning Show, ninety two KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show, ninety two KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Tuesday, November second. Two hours from now, the Beatles will release their newest, uh, latest, and last ever single. Now and then. Um, it's crazy to think. Okay, go back to 1995 with me. 1995, uh, the Beatles anthology series was released. Three giant box sets full of outtakes and alternate takes. And then there was a, uh, a documentary that aired on ABC television on consecutive Sunday nights for a few weeks with all this footage. And it was like this 1995. It had been 25 years since the band broke up. And nobody knew anything about streaming. Nobody knew that careers would be extended forever because of uh, oncoming technology. It felt like this was the end of the yeah. Beatles. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my band at the time, the Black Crows, we were making our fourth album. And we took every Sunday night off to watch the Beatles, to all sit around. We were, in a, we were recording in a house. And we, it was like a you know, must-see TV, appointment television. And we would stop whatever we were doing and watch it and just sit there in absolute awe. Um, and that felt like there were two songs that the Beatles f uh, put out at the time. There was Real Love and Free as a Bird. Mm -hmm. uh, both songs taken from a John Lennon demo, him at the Dakota, 1979 or 1980, playing a piano into a cassette tape recorder. Uh, they were able to lift his vocal off that tape uh, for two songs. And those were, in 1995, this is the last time you'll hear new Beatles music. I mean, it's almost 30 years later. Th you know, yeah. 28 years after the end of the Beatles, they're putting out a new single today mm -hmm. because technology allowed them to take the third of those John Lennon songs, separate the vocal from the piano now in a way that was not possible in 95, and now build a new track underneath the John Lennon vocal, and you've got a Beatles single in the year 20. 23. Uh, a month after the Rolling Stones put out their greatest album in decades. Now, that's still the Rolling Stones going into a studio and plugging in amps and just rocking together. That's not possible, of course, for the Beatles, with two of them uh, long since departed. But this is as close as we're ever going to get. So the biggest band that ever was, the greatest band that ever was, in the year 2023, has finally their final single ever. And we're going to play it for you in a couple hours as soon as it is released upon the world at 9 Central. By the way, the cassette tape that Yoko gave to Paul McCartney in the early 90s that had been sitting in her house for 10 years, yeah. it said on the tape, John Lennon wrote the words for Paul. I, I don't oh, think wow. that was Paul Rubens. I don't think it was Paul Simon. <laughs> Pretty sure it was Paul McCartney he was writing songs for. Um, and so there's always the thought, you know, Paul McCartney said something else in this little video that aired yesterday. Once, John, you know, when we lost John, we knew it was really over. I mean, I mean, that's not something you say when you knew it was over already. And 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 there's been uh, uh, a lot of talk. Uh, McCartney has talked over the years about he and Lennon had put their relationship back together. And Ringo has said recently they were always in communication through the 70s. There would always be three of them ready to get back together and one guy would have a reason not to. And it was a different guy each time. But it seems kind of like 
Had the 80s gone on with John Lennon, there would have been some, maybe not a tour. I think that would have been impossible, frankly. But they would have worked together again. It's incredible to think that now, all these years later, in a way, they're able to work together again. Um, and there are people that uh, you could say sound like John Lennon. His son Julian very much sounds like him. But uh, to hear that, by the way, there there is, because Paul McCartney in his first interview about this new song a couple months ago said we use some AI, a lot of people just assume they falsely created this vocal track the way, you know, we've got Elvis singing uh, Big Butts, that song. You know, you've got, you got Patsy yeah. Cline singing, you know, Run DMC songs now. Mm -hmm. This is not the case. This is an actual John Lennon vocal track track the artificial intelligence was simply used to get the piano out of the way it was it was separating a cassette tape from 1979 separating the parts that's the technology here that's kind of mind-boggling to think about um and I, I was telling you guys this before we went on the air and i'll share something about the beatles because i know we were discussing it like what what's the average person think the beatles are so big they're so omnipresent it's like what's the big deal i've said for years they're the most underrated band ever underrated they're the biggest band that's ever existed they have all the best songs they're they're the most successful band ever how could they possibly be underrated and the reason i say that is because musicians that i've known for decades now every time someone turns into a professional musician every time somebody becomes a recording musician you find yourself in studios you know you're a kid who grows up in your basement and you want to play music and you want to be like the beatles and then you get that chance and you start playing live and you start recording uh records when you start realizing how music is made, how it's reproduced live, how it's recorded in the studio, the Beatles get better to you. Hmm. Um, I, I, and also as a live band, if you look at footage of them from 1963, you, there's, you can't find a four-piece rock and roll band that's that good right now. They, they, were, they were sensational live. Those vocals, the three-part harmonies live without monitors, you know, they were just this different they were on a different realm than any other bands at the time, more so than the Animals or the Stones or the Kinks or any of the great British bands. Um, they were, and then in the studio, because of George Martin being a genius, because of Jeff Emmerich, their recording engineer, being a technical genius, they were also at the forefront of all this latest technology. The more you learn about the Beatles, the more it seems like the further away from them you get. It's one of those... <laughs> bizarre things you know you, you you study how to make records and all of a sudden you get oh i see how they did that i get how led zeppelin one sounds that way with the beatles it gets even like oh wait i'm more confused than ever this is how they <laughs> did this i mean it's yeah. truly they're just on a different level to me and so on a, on a total inside baseball note sitting around with other musicians and especially producers and engineers talking about those beatles recording sessions you know, you said Zepp, you you put on Get Back, the Peter Jackson documentary, yesterday yeah. again. Yeah, right. And you sit around and you watch them conjure songs out of midair, and then you watch them get those takes on the rooftop when it's 30 degrees outside, and they still <laughs> swing and play like that. Like they're just, you know, they had they that whole 10,000 hours thing, they had it before anybody had ever heard of them. They yep. were in Hamburg playing eight hours a night for months on end. They're just still... Uh, an astoundingly great band and i'm you know a, as a fan and then also as a musician i'm just in awe and i can't wait to hear the song by the way 83 year old ringo star guess what he still plays drums exactly like ringo star <laughs> right yeah. just that phil start to ba -ba -bo. i mean it's like i heard that yesterday and i was like are you kidding me yeah it's just ridiculous that dude's feel i mean every drummer's got their own feel but his is still ringo's right. isn't that fascinating that's that's true what you said to people who aren't necessarily musicians don't dissect the brilliance mm -hmm. of the Beatles as much as they should sometimes because they were so big they're almost used to that well the, the like like you know like uh the David Letterman house band bassist Will Lee that guy's been out Letter mm -hmm. was Letterman's bassist forever he has a band called the Faux Four F-A-U the Faux Four for years in New York City uh Greg Bissonette who's now Ringo Starr's drummer he was in a Beatles band in LA for years um, here locally in Minneapolis, John Fields, a friend of mine, a great producer, he plays in a Beatles band. And it's, mm. you have all these musicians, and especially musicians who also make records, and they spend years playing Beatles music because it's just a different thing. There's just mm -hmm. so much to dig into. And the challenge of getting all those little pieces right and in, in order, it's just, it's endlessly challenging for the greatest yeah. musicians ever. And these are just guys who 
couldn't read music. They were just doing <laughs> it. Amazing. They were doing it the way they always did it. And that's, you know, that's why like self-taught musicians are impossible to replicate. You know what I mean? Like I'm a self-taught drummer. Good luck playing like me because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you have a better chance of trying to get a Neil Peart vibe together because he's a disciplined student of the instrument. And you can say, well, who taught him? What did he learn? How did he approach it? Uh, if you want to no, play I like I play? Good luck to you. And if you figure it out, let me know what the hell I'm doing. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Thursday, November the 2nd. Good morning. Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks will be in this very city a week from tomorrow. Friday, November 10th, U.S. Bank Stadium. Billy Joel, as the French call him, L'Homme de Piano. Maybe they call him that. I don't know. The oui. man of the piano. And Stevie Nicks, or as the French call her, that weird witchy gal. Um, they're going to be here together at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Billy Joel, Stevie Nicks, Candace Wheeler all making an appearance that night. It's going to be exciting. And we would love for you to go if you would like to be there. We'd be happy to have you uh, take some tickets off of us. we got a couple to give away right now. We've also got some wild tickets to give away, so... Let's get wild, shall we? We have two callers ready to compete. Tony, what are they going to compete today How in? about that? This will be fun. The KQ Morning <laughs> Show presents... Ah, okay. uh, yes. TV. Oh, not TV. Oh, my God. Is this real? Ah, uh, yes. There's so many choices for entertainment. You can scroll oh, absolutely. and scroll till yep. your fingers bleed. Well, what we're going to do is present to you a title and a brief description of the plot, and then you decide... Is it an actual movie that has been seen or you can see on a streaming TV platform? Or is it something that was entirely made up? Wow. TV or not TV? Woo. That is the question. Excellent. I like it. It's exciting. Let's it get to it, Candace. Who is our first contestant? Kenny from Minneapolis. Kenny, good morning, sir. Good morning. How's everything going for you today? So far, so good. Right on. Let's see if we can make it even better with a couple of Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks tickets. Are you ready to play, sir? Yep. Right on. Tell yep. me. All right, Kenny, number one, Satan's School for Girls. When the police refuse to investigate, a woman enrolls in her murdered sister's school only to discover that the school is bathed in the evil of a devil's cult. Who needs homework? <laughs> TV or not TV? <laughs> wow. That sounds like TV to me. Yes, it is. Kate Jackson starred in 1973. Really? I ain't Kate kidding Jackson. Yet. Wow. Birmingham, mm -hmm. Alabama girl. Is she really? Yeah. She well, and my wife. That's the only two. How about that? Yeah. Number two, the thing with two heads with a successful transplant of the head of a sadistic white bigot to the body of a wrongfully convicted black man on death row. What could possibly go wrong and who keeps the body? TV or not TV? I, uh, that's hilarious. I love watching that movie. That's definitely TV. That's right. 1972 starring Rosie Greer. Wow. What? As, as the head. Oh, yes. my God. I'm more of a Pam Greer when oh, it came to movies. Yeah. yeah, really? That's right, sugar. Holy crap. You would love it. Well, I, I thought, yeah, then that, let's do a Rosie the Riveter, Pam Greer, Rosie Greer match. match <laughs> that, that'll be our next movie project. All right, okay. sorry. Kenny, two for two. Nice start, brother. Nice job, Kenny. Number three, Brandy's Brandy is Mighty Dandy. Kicked out of Princeton, a former Ivy League professor lets down her hair, moves to Baton Rouge, where she opens a distillery to fund her sugar addiction and learns a lesson or two along the way. I don't know about that. How about not TV? You are correct. Yes! That's utter nonsense. And your last one, the incredible Mr. Limpet. An aquatic <laughs> fanatic falls into the sea, transforms into a fish becomes friends with a crab, convinces his Navy friend of his worth, and before you know it, he's helping America win World War II. Not TV. I am sorry, 1964 Don Knott starred in the semi-animated classic. <laughs> the Incredible Mr. Limpet. You got, oh. Any of you guys seen it? Oh, yeah, I love no. that movie. Love that movie. Oh, that, I do great. remember seeing, like, little clips of it. Mm -hmm. I want to hear that conversation when Don Knott's agent calls him. Don? <laughs> 
things are going great with Andy, but I've got a side project for you. Right. Well, what is it? <laughs> just them talking about the plot points. You're a <laughs> fish. Not, not coming out of his trailer. I can't <laughs> believe I signed on to this. <laughs> Kenny, you went three for four, brother. Fine effort. Uh, we're going to put you on hold for a minute, and we're going to see uh, if that's going to be enough to win you those uh, Billy Joel and Stevie Nicks tickets. Candace, who is contestant number two? Drew from Coon Rapids. Drew, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Stevie Nicks, Billy Joel fan, sir? Yeah, you bet. All right, I will bet. And I'm going to bet on you to have a good time playing TV or not TV. Tony, take it away. Drew, number one, Cobra. A secret violent cult called New Order kills weak members of society, prompting a chiseled L.A. cop who wears gloves to eat pizza and cuts it with a scissors to face them in a brutal fight for survival. TV. Correct. Hell yeah, Sylvester 19, Stallone. 1986 with the Brigitte Nielsen. Yeah, saw it in the theater. That's how I little I had to do in life at that time. He was Lieutenant Marion Cabretti. <laughs> That's right, Cabretti. Yeah. Why did Cobra. he eat his pizza with gloves, though, and cut it with his scissors? I don't know. Because he cut his because he was protecting himself against those scissor cuts. That's I gotta, right. I got a cut. I got a band-aid on my finger right now. I'm not making it up because of scissor problems. <laughs> He was bad. He was bad. Drew, number two, got wood. Round and round they go as a fierce lumberjack competition causes friction and chaos between two teams of alcoholic log rollers. Not TV. That is that not is Hollywood <laughs> doing. <laughs> is that not TV? Yeah, yeah really. It's really. crazy. Turn your radio down, Drew. <laughs> or turn it up, please. <laughs> All the way. T- crank it. <laughs> Maybe it was the speaker. Sorry about that. More trebles. No Drew, number three, Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town. A gang of tough-as-nails women bikers roar into town looking for trouble, and they find it in the form of zombies created by a mad scientist who accidentally let them out of their secure cave. Not TV. I'm sorry, <laughs> that is real from 1989. You bet your ass it is. We Chopper got some chicks. chop. Chicks and down in zombie town. And I, then wah, take wah, it. Wah, wah, wah. All I right, Drew. More than two formats. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, right on. Uh, Drew, you got to get this one for a chance to uh, go into overtime. So good luck to you, sir. Good luck, Great. Drew. Number four, Humidity Against Humanity. A rogue government spy organization destroys the calm of a peaceful southern Florida beach town by brainwashing a local TV weatherman and turning him into an assassin. TV. Oh, I'm sorry that one was made up. Man. Cripes. But again, yeah, yeah. we want it to be TV, don't we? Yeah, it'd be good. Drew, two for four, brother, the, but you're not leaving empty-handed. We have Wild versus Devils tonight at the XL Energy Center. Two tickets coming your way. Congrats. Nice. Kenny, you are the big winner, sir. Next Friday night, Billy Joel, Stevie Nicks, and Candace Wheeler at the U.S. Bank Stadium. Ooh. Enjoy that, sir. Gentlemen, thank you both for playing. Thank you. You got it. Right on. All right. Check that out. Well done. Whee! Yeah, I, I can't believe Mr. Limpet was a real movie. The incredible Mr. Limpet. Yeah, the incredible Mr. Limpet. Why are you hating? It's a good movie. They would put the montages so. every once in a while when they did like a Disney montage. I'd be like, oh, there's that one with Don Knotts and the fish. But mm-hmm. it never inspired me to watch it, I it's guess. Good. Yeah, uh, and he sp- finds hey, love. Sure. I'll take your word for Speaking it. Speaking of movies, uh, Candace and I took in a film yesterday the old Main Street Cinema with my buddy Stephen Hyden. We went to see the new David Fincher film, The Killer. How was it? It was okay. Yeah, Fincher yeah, movies good. are I mean, cool. I mean, the, you know, I got through it just fine. Um, this is the guy, of course, uh, Seven, his first movie, Fight Club, mm-hmm. Zodiac, uh, Social Network. I mean, there's a bunch of other, but the, everything the guy does, it's like a big deal. And it's a, it's a, it's a cool movie. Um, I, I would have been fine on Netflix too. You know, I would have been fine mm-hmm. at home watching it. It's a, it, it'll be a, it's a great movie for a flight. I'll tell you that. All right. Yeah, you got a long, entertaining, you got know? a long flight, man. Dial it up. Candace, we enjoyed it. Yeah, it was entertaining. You didn't sit by me, but that's okay. <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> I, I, hey, man, and if there's an empty theater. You put a seat between you two person. It's okay, I'm not offended at all. Yeah, well, I don't. I wouldn't care if you were. I, <laughs> I didn't sit next to you or my buddy. There was five seats for three people, the uh-huh. way God intended. You're right. I'm over it. Do you have movie snacks? 
I did. I got some popcorn, mm-hmm. and um, they have so many fun seasonings to put on your popcorn. What? There. That's yeah, crazy. What was that? <laughs> what was on Be that careful. popcorn? I put Old Bay on it. That's where it you was, yeah. Nuts. Tasted like shrimps. Uh, I didn't get any because I I just assumed Candace would would and so and I was correct. Yeah. I had a few pieces of that popcorn and went, that's kind of gross. And then uh, just watched the movie and enjoyed it. <laughs> and then we walked out of the theater at two thirty to just a host of police officers and Secret Service people. The entire neighborhood was on lockdown oh, right. for the president's visit yesterday. Um, and and then boy, I mean, I, I live right there, and man. I've never seen more uh, barricades and and police cars and black SUVs in my life. That guy, they they create a little bit of space for Biden and and company. Yeah, the president's in town. You got to make sure no one gets close to him. Yeah. Who man, it was crazy. Right. What an operation everywhere. And I mean, it's not because it's Biden. It's because it's the president. Mm -hmm. Anywhere the president goes, just the number of people involved, uh, with good reason. Uh, but but shocking to see it up close yesterday. I get to see it really up close one time. Try stalling on the road on 35W coming out of Minneapolis sometime when the president's motorcade is zooming by. <laughs> yeah. You get all sorts oh. of attention. Oh, I bet you do. Uh, Greg Harris of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame oh, nice. is going to yeah. uh, make some sort of stab at trying to get some of us interested in this year's um, Hall of Fame induction ceremony by unveiling the lineup of special guests. Excellent. We'll talk to him at 8 o'clock. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Thursday, November the 2nd. We still got a lot going on on the show today. First things first, in an hour, we're going to have a new Beatles single to play for you. It will be released at 9 Central all around the world. The song is called Now and Then. And we're going to play the bad boy. I can't wait. Um, in 30 minutes, Sam Ekstrom's going to join us to talk about this Vikings team and what we can expect from the new quarterback, Joshua Dobbs, for the rest of the season, et cetera, et cetera. We're also at 9 o'clock, by the way, going to be giving away tickets, another listener game. That's kind of exciting. And right now, in just a few moments, Greg Harris is going to join us, the president and CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will be sharing with us some of the special guests that will be on hand tomorrow night at this year's induction ceremony. Uh, We've talked to Greg a couple times already this year. Uh, He's a good dude, and he runs a a place, uh, has the impossible job of um, explaining the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame selections every year. (laughs) Um, The the selection, when they announce who gets in, that's always kind of fraught because everyone wants to argue. But now it's all good because it's just a question of, the, 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 the good part of the gig, which is the induction ceremony tomorrow. Greg now joins us on the horn. Good morning, Greg. Hey, good morning. How are you, man? Uh, all is well on this end, sir. How you feeling? Um, a, he- a day ahead of the induction ceremony. Uh, what, are you going to wake up on Sunday, uh, you know, uh, Monday next week? Is it just relief? Is it exhaustion? W- what are the feelings after you get through the induction ceremony? You know, um, what happens for me is every year I'm at the ceremony and I see it and I think, like, this was the best one ever. And it, it can't get any better than this. And then you come back the next year and you feel the same thing. Um, so that's, that's one of the, the main things. And um, it, it happens so quickly and it's so jam-packed um, with honoring these artists and tons of performances by uh, other artists and tribute to them that in the days after you – you you run into people or you're online. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot that they did that. Mm-hmm. I forgot that those uh, you know the Eurythmics got on stage and, and joined so and so. You know, just things like that. It's just pretty incredible. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. It is pretty great. There's got to be a, a, a bizarre thing of, like you said, it gets over, and then every year you feel like you have to top it. But the good news is, every year you kind of feel like you do. So, uh, some new presenters and performers this year. You've got quite a list here. Do you want to read some of them? Do you want me to read them? Uh, well, no, I'm looking at it right now. Stevie Nicks, we did hear last week she was going to be on hand. I'm assuming she's going to be a part of the Cheryl Crow induction. Uh, probably a good assumption. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. Um, anytime Stevie Nicks walks into the room, there, there's an immediate charge. The, the atmosphere changes pretty quickly. So that's that's she's going to be here in Minneapolis next week. We've been talking about that for, for months now. Uh, Carrie Underwood, Common, Ice T, Sia. I mean, just that group right there uh, covers quite a wide spectrum. 
Oh yeah, and, and uh, you know, and, and her is quite a guitar player is going to be on the show as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you just it's and you have the actual artists that are the ones being honored. These are the special guests and the presenters, sure. and performers, and um, the, the list. Uh, Keeps getting bigger too. You mentioned Stevie Nicks, St. Vincent's on the show. Uh, just added Olivia Rodrigo. Wow. Um, to the show, and um, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. I think you may have mentioned it, but it's on Disney Plus. As it happens, for anybody out there in uh, in, in the Midwest in Minnesota that isn't making it to New York, it's going to be live for the first time ever. Uh, as it happens on Disney Plus. Yeah, that's that is pretty fascinating because you guys always have the luxury of of uh, taking it all later, editing it down, making it just nice and tight. Uh, there's there's a little bit of a it's got to put a little bit of heat under the producers, the actual TV guys, to get this thing keep it running on time. It's exciting. Uh, you know, yes, the the producers do the best they can, and then it's also that you know this is a career honor, and if somebody wants to talk a little longer. They talk a little longer. Sure. If uh, if the music goes longer, um, but there's a range and there's a goal, and then after you know the live stream is going to be out there uh, available on, on Hulu um, and and uh, Disney Plus and places like that. But there's a f- edited show that's going to air on January first on ABC as a primetime special. That's fantastic. Um, is it is every is every performance a, a sort of a unique situation in terms of um, you know you've got you've got the inductee and then you've got artists who want to be there to pay tribute and honor them. Who decides what they're going to do? I mean, do the artists that are coming in like we just we just shared? Okay, Stevie Nicks, Common, Sia is joining. You know, Elton John's going to be there. Brandy Carlile. Do they come to you and say this is what I want to do, or do, uh, is there a suggestion of what they might do? How does that all work out, or is it a case by case basis? It, it's it's fairly. All right, so there's there's show producers that are producing the show. John Sykes, who is um the. Uh, uh, the the chairman of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation Board, uh, Joel Parisman, who's the president, and Joel Gallen, who's a um, great uh, producer out of L.A. that does a lot of music things. They they think about who is what song should be done, who is the right fit. They talk to the artist, and you know who in, who influenced who and who impacted who, mm-hmm. um, and you get these wonderful connections. You know, um, a few years ago they reestablished that Brian May. Uh, was a huge influence and, and very helpful early on to Def Leppard, and that they were um, remained friends. So Brian May did the induction and then played with them, and uh, you kind of build these combinations. It's where we had um, uh, Robert Smith of the Cure, it, you know, inducting uh, Nine Inch Nails, mm-hmm. or other way around, Trent Reznor inducting uh, right. the Cure, and you find these these magical connections that that touch generations and come across bridges and then you start to build what happens on stage and what are the iconic songs what are the right songs for the artist to do um and frequently you know it's a full-on band that's all together but then they're joined by others uh as well uh this year's uh i should say we're speaking with greg harris president and ceo of the rock and roll hall of fame the inductees who we've been talking about all year uh the one that jumps off the list to me first and foremost uh is forever willie nelson have you spent any time with willie um you know i I had the the pleasure of um of, of zooming with willie the day he got the news about being inducted into the rock and roll hall of fame and in the perfectly fitting way, he was on his bus. Um, I believe he was in L.A., um, but st- but on the bus and, and touring. And we, we talked for a bit about that, that moment and what it means. And also, you know, a chance to share with him that he's not only joining, you know, all these rock and roll artists and all these great soul artists, but he's joining Bob Wills is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. And Hank Williams is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And Johnny Cash. And uh, it was kind of, a, I think, a moment for him to realize that it's not just about, you know, what, what, how people classify things. It's about the influences and the impact. And, um, yeah, just an, a, a wonderful person. Uh, yeah, there's there, there are a few artists in any realm of music who've influenced more rock and rollers than Willie Nelson over the last 50 years. I mean, I'm from personal experience and just anecdotally, 
Um, anybody that doesn't care for Willie at least has generally has the smarts to keep it to themselves. He's he has a huge shadow over the entire thing. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction induction ceremony, thirty eighth annual. It's going down tomorrow night at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Disney Plus will be streaming it live as it happens, and then Monday, January first, uh, it will be shown on ABC Primetime. That's pretty exciting. Uh, this I, I said earlier before you came on. There's the announcement of who's getting in every year, where you and everyone from the Hall of Fame just gets yelled at on Twitter, and then this is the good part. This is where we're just celebrating. So uh, I hope you have a great weekend. You've certainly earned it, and uh, we look forward to talking to you next year when we bitch about who didn't get in again. It's always a pleasure. You know, I, I love that because right now, yeah, let's pause that. Let's yeah, celebrate of course. This class, and then let's pick it all up in January and start to, you know, the debate of who should be in and who shouldn't. And uh, these these folks are getting the spotlight this Friday night, and fans of them around the world are, are joining and celebrating and, frankly, can watch it as it happens for the first time ever. So it's going to be a blast. And uh uh, I look forward to chatting with you in January uh, when we're when we're past this and we can discuss who should be in and, and where they stand. Of course. Well, have a great weekend, man. It's always a pleasure, Greg. Thanks. All right. Cheers. Thanks. See ya. Um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame going down tomorrow night. And then again, if you're not watching it live, January 1st, you can check it all out. By which time, every single clip will have been shared on Twitter a billion times. And you'll be like, I already saw this. What's yeah. happening? When yeah. he mentioned uh, Zooming with Willie. Yeah. That took on a couple different meanings. Every, yes, it's certain. I had the same thought exactly. <laughs> a lot of people Zoom with Willie on a regular yeah. basis. <laughs> um, hey, late night television has a new show coming. Stephen Colbert last night announced the later uh, version. You know, after Colbert, we had, what's his name? James Corden for years, uh, the affable singing Brit who has pulled the plug on his show. And now Stephen Colbert on his show last night on Late Night announced there's a new show. It's going to be called After Midnight. And the new host for the CBS Late Late Show is, first of all, not even 30 years old. And secondly, a woman, a comedian named Taylor Tomlinson. Really mm -hmm. like her. Yeah, she's funny. Came out of literally nowhere in the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess she had a, she was a part of a, I think she was on a Netflix comedy show with like a 15-minute set in 2018. And that just went beyond viral. And she's had several Netflix specials. And I, you know, I clicked on a couple things like on Facebook, it would pop up or Instagram. I'd be like, who's this? This is a few years ago. And now my feed, I get every clip online yeah. and I watch every one of them. She's a spectacular stand up. She is really sassy and smart. Because I don't drink, I don't do drugs. Like somebody offered me weed in college once and they were like, Taylor, just try it. Okay. It will open your eyes. I'm like, your eyes are half closed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be healthier. Uh, my brain doesn't work like that, though. I asked a friend of mine, she's very like health conscious. I asked her what her favorite foods were the other day. She told me cranberries, blueberries, and almonds. I was like, those are ingredients. <laughs> She's good, man. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've watched a lot. Like I said, I've, I've, I've never watched a whole special, but I've seen a thousand 30 to 90 second clips. And, and like I said, anytime I see that face pop up, I click on it because they're always funny. Mm -hmm. Really uh, honest about her relationships and addictions and yep, everything. foibles. Growing up in a, in a super conservative, ultra religious household, mm -hmm. and then, you know, in California. Yeah, she's great. Um, uh, whether that makes for good TV, I guess we'll all find out. Yeah. But I think, it's a, I think it's an inspired hire for late night television. A young, um, young chick. Good yeah, move. Seems to be. James Corden, by the way. Uh, remember last year when the big story broke that a restaurant in New York had banned him, Balthazar, oh, yeah. the French bistro, and <laughs> right. and like all these people, like the, I, I, there's been a ton of people apparently waiting in the wings with knives, hoping they would get their chance. Because man, the second someone said that guy's kind of a kind of a jerk, I mean, they all came out of the woodwork. Man, everybody had a James Corden story that was really unexpected. I just always thought he was like, oh, he's a happy, chappy guy. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Who knows? Yeah, those people never seem to be, though, do they? I mean, every time you hear, I mean, even Johnny Carson was kind of a weirdo. David Letterman was very standoffish. They oh, sure, kind of sure. Tell, you know, Jimmy Fallon, now it turns out, is an insufferable prick, according to his staff. Well, yeah. You know, and Ellen and everyone else. I guess, you know, to get a show, you just got to be a D-bag. Well, I do think Colbert is the exception to that rule. He He's universally talked about in, in warm tones, like he's actually a good dude. 
Um, and I loved him on Strangers with Candy 25 years ago. Yes. Um, thought he was incredible. I thought he was great on The Daily Show. I thought the Colbert Report was hilarious. But honestly, as a late night host, I'm just kind of, eh, it's okay. I don't know. I think I need it. I think I like. I, I think I like my pricks on TV late at night. <laughs> you don't hear a lot of horror stories about Kimmel. No, no. Uh, used to be. He's the guy. He's definitely. Um, what would they say? Evolved. He's what are you very, talking very about? changed. Talk um, to Matt over Damon. He hates him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty great shtick, actually. Yeah, yeah, Always pretty good. Um, I, I, you know, uh, it's funny. I Jimmy Kimmel uh, is the only other person. Let's see who who do we oh we had Henry Winkler on the show a few months ago mm -hmm. remember and yeah. I refer I mentioned a movie that he made in the late seventies called The One and Only that I always loved and he goes you know who else loves that the only person who's ever mentioned it Jimmy Kimmel <laughs> and I saw the other day Winkler's book came out and Kimmel posted a photo of himself standing in Jimmy Kimmel's house he's got a giant poster of the One and Only framed that Henry signed wow and I was like yeah me and J so if I ever meet Jimmy I'm gonna be like you and me we're the only ones that like that movie <laughs> all right we got that going for us something Ooh. to talk about yeah I gotta have something here's something to talk about the Vikings season upside down so we turn to our Vikings insider Sam Ekstrom to make some sense of this. You know he's been living, eating, breathing this for the past few days. We'll talk to Sam here at 8.30. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Thursday, November the 2nd. The Minnesota Vikings are heading down to the ATL to play the Falcons this Sunday. Who in the world are we going to be seeing in this game? Let's discuss it. Sam Ekstrom joins us, host and Vikings insider for the podcast network Locked on Minnesota. You hear Sam on the Ron Johnson show, the Minnesota Football Party, and the Vikings postcast after each game. Sam, uh, good morning, sir. First things first, last week you told us your pick was 23-19 Vikings over Packers. You said love would be sacked five times. Uh, I, was it three or four sacks? There, were, You were almost on the money with that one. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like I, I had a good beat on that game. You know, as the week went on, I think I felt more and more confident about the Vikings win, and I, I promise you this is true. On my Friday show, I said the Vikings by two touchdowns, and that came to fruition. So I changed my mind. Okay. I went even more bullish on the Vikings, and it came true um, with a big win. But thank you for keeping the, the receipts. I'm, I'm sure that if you keep doing that, you'll catch me in a lot of bad predictions. Well, well yeah, and we're going to we'll, we'll grill you here in just a few minutes about this Sunday. But first things first, let's talk about Joshua Dobbs, the new guy brought in at quarterback. I don't think he's getting the start this week, but I would not be surprised to see him on the field sooner than later. What are your thoughts on Joshua Dobbs, what you've seen before? And then give me your thoughts on what you think he's going to be able to do for the Vikings. So it might not be fair to totally judge Josh Dobbs on what he's done with Arizona because mm -hmm. he was brought in as a tank quarterback. They brought him in at the last second to take over that team before the season, gave him no off season in that offense. And considering that, considering there's no talent around him or no intention for that team to win, I thought he did pretty well. Mm -hmm. I thought he did pretty well in Arizona. He moves around really well. Um, he's got some arm talent. He's not the, the best quarterback in the world, no. But, I mean, for what he was given, I thought that he conducted himself very professionally. And, in fact, the Cardinals were in a lot more games than they thought they would be um, and even pulled one big upset against Dallas. So put him with a coaching staff intent on winning and a lot more talent around him, he might be able to do some stuff. I mean, he certainly has the intelligence. Um, he's 28. He's got, like, a rocket science degree in college. I mean, he's... He's a sharp one, so I think that there's potential for Josh Dobbs to, to keep this team afloat if he does take over in the coming weeks. Well, tell us something about Jaron Hall. He's already been written off by most people. Does Jaron Hall have a shot? Does he have any talent here? You know, I was really excited to watch Jaron Hall this preseason and training camp um, just based on the film I watched back from his BYU career. Wasn't super blown away by what he did early on. Sometimes, you know, first impressions lie to you in the NFL. Sometimes you don't pick it up immediately. And I thought that he had a pretty rough camp. Um, I thought that when he was thrown into games, he was at a disadvantage because he was, you know, getting 
uh, blocked by third string offensive lines and throwing to third string wide receivers late in those preseason games. So again, same deal as Dobbs. Let's see him with some real talent and some real protection. Didn't think his training camp was very good. If you watch him back in college, he does a lot of exciting things moving out of the pocket. He's got that mobility, but I think we've learned here that mobility is not enough. You got to have the arm talent and the mobility. If you want to be a Patrick Mahomes and, um, and right now I think Jaron Hall is still, you know, trying to process things as a rookie. So, so green. I, my, yeah. I, I've got modest expectations, right? Yeah. He's just so green. It would be, uh, it would be difficult for anyone who, you know, doesn't have that superstar skill to come in as a rookie in this situation and do well. But, uh, yeah, I'm interested to see him play. I kind of want to see what he does with this first unit as well, although it will probably end up Dobbs football team, uh, if not this Sunday, uh, by next weekend. Yeah, I, I think that they're in a very safe place right now where they can give it, give the reins to Jaron Hall and let him go this week, and then you just ride it as long as it's going well. So if it does go super well this week, if they win um, and Hall plays well, doesn't make too many mental mistakes, then I think you can feel safe riding with him for one more week. It's not like you have a gauntlet of opponents coming up. These are all winnable games. Um, and then once it uh, once it turns, once you feel like he doesn't give you the best chance to win or if he's uh, throwing the ball away, fumbling the football, then I think it's a very clear passing of the baton to the veteran Dobbs. And then he probably takes over, you know, as, as long as it goes well for him, they have options here, guys, but you know what they say? If you have two quarterbacks, Mm -hmm. you don't really have any. Sam Ekstrom's with us on the KQ morning show, Sam, uh, to your point. Yeah. If there's ever a time when you want to play the Falcons, it's probably this week, Uh, a, a highly rated defense that said last time we saw the Falcons, they gave up four touchdowns to Will Levis, a rookie coming in for the Tennessee Titans. He looked like Bart Starr out there all of a sudden. So uh, I don't think we can really count on the Falcons' defensive uh, numbers and rankings to really hold up uh, against uh, white-hot scrutiny under the lights. Um, it They are also bringing out uh, Taylor Heineke for his first start of the season. So all things considered, uh, how formidable of a challenge do you think the Vikings are right now? Yeah, I... Uh, again, speaking to the Falcon side of things, I don't think Heineke is un- an unbeatable quarterback by any means. The Vikings have the scouting report on him pretty well. Mm-hmm. And they handled him in Washington last year. So I think the-, the Falcons are probably looking at a relatively low offensive output game. So you're not asking Jaron Hall to do that much. What's going to trip this team up is the running game. The running game has been so hit or miss this year and against the Packers they were a total miss and in a couple games this year Kirk Cousins was just so masterful on third downs that it didn't matter that they struggled in the run if they're in third and eight third and nine third and ten with Jaron Hall it's going to be a problem so they've got to run the ball and I'm worried that they aren't capable of doing that consistently against a fairly good front seven. They did lose uh, Grady Jarrett in Atlanta to mm-hmm. injury, who's a really key piece. But um, if they can't run the ball, it might be a long day for Jared Hall if he's forced to drop back 35 times. Sam, um, one bright light for, for the Vikings for sure has obviously been Jordan Addison. I mean, he came in very highly touted, but I think it's safe to say he's exceeding, um, if not expectations, he's certainly exceeding hopes, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he's a 5'9", five, 5'10 five, guy that plays kind of like he's 6'2". He, he makes contested catches. He's tough, um, and he's obviously super, super fast. That's his superpower. Um, that's why they drafted him is because of his ability to separate, and he's got sticky hands. He catches everything in his vicinity. It, it's impossible not to be infatuated by this kid, and now that he's really come into his own, Justin Jefferson comes back a week from Sunday and you're giving whoever your quarterback is, you're giving them a dynamic one, two punch. So the Jordan Addison thing, and remember he was the fourth receiver taken. There was a stretch of wide receivers taken in the draft. Three other guys went right before him and uh, arguably he is the best of the bunch. 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, certainly numbers wise, and just just the eyeball test is pretty spectacular. Uh, we we haven't really talked about the Vikings defense. It just seems to be a work in progress, heading in the right direction every week. A little more solid, a little uh, more seemingly sure of themselves. Would you agree? After that Green Bay performance, I mean, Jordan Love is not Aaron Rodgers, but still, the the Packers offense was hapless against the Vikings D. Yeah, boy, the Packers are in a world of hurt with that offense right now. Um, and the Vikings made them look really bad. And they've done that now against some other bad quarterbacks. They've, they've made Chicago look very bad. They've made Carolina look very bad. But then you've got that San Francisco game mixed in there, too. And, and San Francisco looked anything but dominant in that game. So mm-hmm. I think you're, you're seeing now a pattern, um, four out of five games, really, where this Vikings defense has been um, excellent stymieing opposing offenses and I think that that's a, a just a wonderful encouraging sign for what they could maybe do as this season progresses last year the defensive scheme never it never took like they, they said all along well just wait just wait we're figuring it out and they never figured it out and this year it seems like they are figuring it out in season and improving as the year goes along and I got to give a shout out to those cornerbacks I mean they are uh, they've been really good in coverage. Caleb Evans, Byron Murphy, they've held their own, and they've opened things up for that pass rush and those safeties to make some plays. So credit Brian Flores for doing what he's doing. The one negative, guys, is that the defense is doing so well that Brian Flores could easily be getting some head coaching looks mm-hmm. in the offseason. So this might just be a one-year uh, relationship between the Vikings and Flores. Yeah, that's always the uh, that's always the risk for sure. All right, Sam, uh, Vikings at Falcons. What's your pick? I sense a low scoring affair. Vikings will rally around their new quarterback and squeak one out, nineteen to eighteen. There will be a safety in the game and four total turnovers. It will not be a work of art, but the Vikings will scrape together a win. <laughs> wow. A safety and count them four total turnovers. Man, that's I like the specifications of Sam's picks. That's awesome. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, brother. Thanks, Steve. Um, hey, th- this week's reminder that there are no good ideas left in music. There's a Broadway musical coming out that's based on the music of... Huey Lewis and the News. Right. <laughs> I mean, nothing against Huey yeah. Lewis and the News. Yeah. It's a solid band. Right. I'd but, go. But there's a play called The Heart of Rock and Roll. It previews start on Broadway in March at the James Earl Jones Theater on Broadway. It's described as, quote, a raucous rom-com mm. about, quote, a couple of 30-somethings who know exactly what they want from life. Until they find each other. Sometimes bad is bad. Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> Sometimes, didn't they do an entire, yeah, I know they did an entire Broadway show about ABBA music. So, uh, I mean, and cats. Didn't they do something about ugh. cats? There was something about a cat or two. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Boy, the power of love. Do you believe in love? I'm working just trying for to think. a living. Is, working for a living, is, sure. If this is it. I, I do remember thinking, like, when that album Sports, or as I always called it, Sports, when that came out, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, hey, man, that's a good band. Those are some catchy songs. By the time I heard Hip to Be Square, I was like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm out. I'm out Heart on the news. Soul. Whew, man. And then, and then Huey with the uh, often overlooked qu- a brief acting career. He was in a yeah. couple of Robert Altman films. Um, and f- including, if I'm not, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but in, in, was it Shortcuts where he went full frontal? Really? Huey, yeah. Huey's no. peep? I don't remember. Hung remember like that. a draft horse. Never made it through <laughs> yeah. any Altman films. Yeah, yeah, Huey Lewis. I think I think he's fishing and he decides to take a leak and it's like, <laughs> hey, why not? You know, if, huh. if you got it, flaunt it. It was one of those moments for Huey Lewis. I saw him in a karaoke movie. That was his, that was his thing. Ooh, really? Yeah, he nailed it. I don't know about that. Hey, uh, check this out. You can meet up with 92KQRS as we rock the pantry Monday, November 13th from 5 to 7 at New Bohemia in Golden Valley. Bring a grocery bag of non-perishable food or other necessities and get yourself a free beer and an order of fries on us. Plus, you'll have a chance to win tickets to upcoming concerts and other prizes. Rock the pantry will benefit Prism's Marketplace food shelf in Golden Valley. Valley, Monday, November 13th, 5 to 7 at New Bohemia. Come on out. Yeah, sounds like a good barter right there. It's the KQ Morning Show.
92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. In a few minutes from right now, uh, we are going to play for you the new Beatles single, Now and Then. Um, yeah, it's 2023, and there's a new Beatles single. That's right. And in just a few minutes, we will play it for the first time on this station, as stations around the world will be doing the very same thing. Kind of a cool day around here, but before we get to the Beatles, we have a little business to take care of of our own, and that is we got some tickets to give away. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to play a game with two callers, and then we will give them a choice. We have a choice of tickets for these callers to take. Uh, on the one hand, they may choose to go to see Chris Stapleton in April, Saturday, April 6th at the U.S. Bank Stadium, or they may choose to take a night in town next Friday at the 7th Street Entry to see my band, the Bagmen, playing. We're going to give you that choice. I will not be offended when you choose Bagmen over Chris Stapleton. Not at all. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, come on. Who are we kidding? Uh, but we've got, so we got a couple things to give away. And Tony, what's to, what's the game we're going to play in order to do this? Uh, this is a new one that uh, we've crafted, and perhaps this will be enjoyable. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. <laughs> hmm. So some people change their names. Some go by an alias. Mm -hmm. Can you really know someone? You know, the same goes for fictitious characters. You think you know them, but... We're going to reveal the real names of fictitious characters, but first, you got to guess which one it is. That's how that works. I like it. All right. I'm always up for a new game, and uh, apparently two of our callers are also. Candace, who's contestant number one? We have Paul from Prior Lake. Paul, good morning, sir. Good morning. How's your day so far? So far, it's really good. All right. Well, uh, we're going to give you a chance to win tickets to one of two shows. Are you ready to play Who Are You Really? Yes, sir. Right on. Let's do it. Yes, sir. And happy El Dia de los Muertos to you, Paul. No, I love it when you speak you. Greek. And also to you. Uh, okay, number one, Captain Crunch's full name is A, Captain Ahab Poseidon Crunch, B, Captain Ned Everything Bagel Toasty Crunch, or C, Captain Horatio Magellan Crunch. A. Hey. Cripes, I'm sorry. It is Captain Horatio Magellan Crunch. Wow. That's what I meant. Who really? knew? Yeah. I would, I would, hey, Paul, if it's any consolation, I would have been right over, uh, I would have been all over A myself. But uh, all right, live and learn. Let's move on. That's all right. Off we go. Number two, the comic book guy on The Simpsons has a name. Is it A, David Halberstam, B, Jeff Albertson, or C, Mitch Trubisky? I have no clue. I'm going to say C. Mm. Yikes. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's Jeff Albertson. <laughs> it is Jeff. The yes. comic book guy, yeah. Jeff Albertson. <laughs> wow. He has a name. Fair enough. That's all right. Got uh, two more. Number three, okay. Alan Hale Jr. played the skipper on Gilligan's Island. His character's name was A, Caleb Monstro, B, Jonas Grumby, or C, Byron Leftwich. B. Yes. Damn straight. Good for you. Everybody knows Jonas Grumby. Little My buddy. I met him one time. You met him? My dad did at his restaurant in Florida. Oh, nice. He's a very nice man. Wow. Of course, he's dead now. But... Well, hey, you know, a lot, lot yeah. of good folks are. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah. Your last one. In the movie E.T., Steven Spielberg actually revealed the name of the extraterrestrial. Was it A, Gazoo, B, Zrek, or C, Newman? That's right. It was Zrek. Zrek the E.T. Zrek? How about How, what's that? What's that spelling? Z-R-E-K, of course. Wow, fair oh, enough. How else would you it? spell Zrek? Fair <laughs> enough. All right, Paul, uh, Good way, way to rebound, brother. You went two for four. Mm -hmm. uh, we're uh -huh. going to put you on hold. We'll go to contestant number two, so hang tight for a moment. Candace, who is I contestant will. number two? <laughs> All right. I will, Steve. <laughs> we have Diane from Forest Lake. Diane, good morning. Good morning. How's your day? Going good. Great. Uh, are you ready to play Who Are You Really? Yes, I am. Good answer. Tony, take it away. Let's go. Number one in the Curious George series, there is the man with the yellow hat. He has a name. Is it A, Bananas Foster, B, Gage Butterscotch, or C, Ted Shackelford? Ted Shackelford. 
It's Ted Shackelford, but yes, <laughs> Ted, you got you got the Shackelford. I think that's what that's what I heard. Ted Shackelford. Golly, I had no idea. Yeah. I was really hoping it was Bananas Foster. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, Sesame Street's beloved cookie monster. His actual name is A. Sid, B. Saul, C. Simon. Oh, C. Simon. No, I'm sorry. It is Sid. Sid the cookie monster. Sid, Saul, Simon. Cookie. That's almost like Manny, Moe, and Jack. Name Sid. Sid, Saul, and Simon. Mm -hmm. The Pep Boys. All right. (laughs) Let's go. Number three. Number three, the Pillsbury Doughboy's name is A, Poppin' Fresh, B, Bustin' Balls, or C, Crackin' Wise. Poppin' Fresh. That's right. (laughs) Poppin' (laughs) Fresh was a restaurant on Ford Parkway, Highland Park Honeys. We're all servers there. Really? Yeah, back in the day. Go figure. You know, the Doughboy has a wife and two kids. The wife's name is Poppy. The two kids are Popper and Bun Bun, (laughs) FYI. Wow. Now you know. Man, they're like rabbits, those little guys. <laughs> um, all right, Diane, if you get this next one right, you will win and have your choice of tickets. If not, we're going into a tiebreaker. Good luck. You can do it, Diane. Your last one, Scooby-Doo's Shaggy's real name is Norm Shostakovich, B, Pete Buttigieg, or C, Norville Rogers. I'll say C. You got it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Norval Rogers? Norval Rogers. I'd go with Shaggy myself, yeah. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Diane, uh, three out of four is enough to win. Congratulations. You have a choice to see either Chris Stapleton Saturday, April the 6th, or you can come to the 7th Street entry a week from tomorrow to see my band, The Bagmen. Your choice, Diane. What are you going to do? Well, sorry, but I have to take Chris Stapleton. You and me both. I yeah. get it. Totally. Make no mistake. Uh, that's quite all right. Have a, It'll be a great show. I'm sure you'll have a good time. Paul, that means you have tickets to see Bagman next Friday night at 7th Street Entry. Nice. Very nice. I, I hope you Thank make you it out, much. brother. We're going to have a good night. Um, we'll see and, the rest of us, too. And, we're, yeah, we're all going to be there rocking out. So uh, thank you guys both for calling in and playing. Okay. Thank you. You got yeah. it. Uh, that's a nice way to kick off the 9 o'clock hour, mm-hmm. uh, although it's probably not as cool as saying we got a new song by the Beatles. Zep, have they dropped that bad boy yet? No, oh, shoot, I forgot all about it. Is it 9 o'clock? <laughs> it seems Crap. to be. hold on a second. Yeah. I've got it. Oh. Okay, so um, after, <laughs> after a few months of teasing the world, the Beatles do have what is now the final Beatles single. Again, the John Lennon... Uh, vocal taken from a cassette tape from 19, I think, 79. If not, it was 80. A song that he was putting together. And uh, Paul and Ringo added some uh, George work from the mid-90s. And now we have the final, after all these years, Beatles track. Let's have a listen, shall we? It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. The Beatles right there. They Boy, they always knew a good outro. Yeah, <laughs> they, they knew how to get out of a song, didn't they? Wow, yeah. that's really something to hear that for the first time. Um, a, a little a, a slow, a little dirgy, and by the end, it's got just total momentum. It's just cooking by the time it hit that, mm-hmm. after the solo, when it hit that final little chorus. It was just rolling right along, man. Yeah. That's haunting, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I kind of get tearing up a little bit just because it's the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Steve mentioned earlier that the cassette that he recorded that on, was labeled for Paul. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, I thought maybe a little more Paul McCartney in there. I thought maybe he might, you know, interject himself with something mm-hmm. new, but kept it pure right there. You could hear, you could definitely hear, you know, the inspired George Harrison slide guitar in there with its Eastern influence. And of course, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Paul and George, the rhythm section, or I mean, Paul and Ringo. It's, um, yeah, I, I mean, it really is funny. It's like, yeah, that, that's the Beatles. That's them mm-hmm. right yeah, there. Uh, you know, it's interesting because, yeah, the song Free as a Bird that they did in 95, Paul did add a bridge to that song. Yeah. Um, this one, I guess they figured they had enough to go with. I was just thinking, as much as we all love John, as much as Paul and Ringo clearly do, imagine being Yoko Ono and hearing that finished product 43 oh, wow. years later yeah. and you're like, oh, yeah, that's uh, that's that guy still. Or or not to mention Julian or Sean, his sons. Uh, man, Fair, fair play to Peter Jackson for developing uh, with his company the ability to pull that vocal out. I mean, mm-hmm. none of that happens without 
uh, a whole lot of people behind the scenes developing technology. Again, for all of the evils and scary things that AI is going to bring to our life, uh, it, it, it pulling that vocal away from the piano from a cassette tape from 1979, yeah, fair enough. Thanks yeah. a lot. And by the way, the literal cassette tape is exactly the, the original cassette tape. This is what I'm thinking. Yoko got it, and she had it. John Lennon died in the end of the, uh, what December 1980. She gave it to Paul in the early 90s. So she hung on to a cassette tape for over a decade, gave it to Paul, who has since made sure it was somewhere yeah. all yeah. these years. Where, where has that cassette tape been? Right. And what, I mean, how much bubble wrap can one cassette tape uh, <laughs> have around it? You know, like, and I'm sure there were copies made, but from the things I read, they took the original. Seriously, mm -hmm. they still the first gen, the one Lennon hit record and sang onto a machine to put it on that tape. That's what they sent to Peter Jackson. Yeah, what Incredible. if they actually recorded over it or something? I'm sure they busted oh, the little God. tab off, right? <laughs> let's right. hope. Let's hope yeah. the tabs were busted <laughs> back in the day. Stuck it in his old uh, cassette box with all those Wings cassettes. You I know? imagine that song will be streamed more than any other on planet Earth today. Could yeah. be wrong. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you know, there's a new Swifty song that people are gonna, the kids are gonna get excited about. But for anybody over 40 that's going to be your number one song for a while i was a little panicked only there during the game show because i thought i didn't have time to record it you know onto a hard drive and then play it again after the game show i started getting nervous comes in at four minutes and nine seconds and i thought man if this website freaking crashes on me <laughs> yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go nuts uh by the way the video for that song comes out tomorrow Oh, very nice. Oh, cool. Yeah, Very nice. All right, there it is. Wow. Okay, that'll give me something to think about for the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is November 2nd, 2023, and moments ago, before that last break, we just played the new single by the Beatles. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like, if you heard right now, I was just thinking about this, listening to Crazy Little Thing Called Love. If you said, hey, man, they got a new song. Queen is going to release a single. It's got a Freddie Mercury vocal take no one's ever heard. It'd be like, oh, I totally want to check that out. That'd mm -hmm. be kind of cool. Um, there, there, Any number of artists, you could say like, oh, they've got a new song. They found a vocal. I mean, it would be compelling no matter who it would be, honestly. Even if it's a band I don't care for. It's like, oh, wait, a 35, 40-year-old vocal take and they've built it up. That's interesting to me. But when it's the Beatles, it just, it just hits differently. At a time when the Rolling Stones have just released their 146,000th album, and it's actually really, really good. Yeah. Uh, to know that on the heels of that, here comes the Beatles with their final single. Uh, pretty crazy. I, I just saw, I, I mentioned earlier, I think McCartney first talked about this, and I said it was, uh, what, late July or August? It was June. It oh, was okay. June when McCartney said, by the way, we have a new Beatles song coming. And then now, and so it was six months of waiting for it after he made that announcement. And I do think it's fascinating that it came on the heels of the Stones album release. This is just like in yeah. the 60s. The Stones and the Beatles would check in with each other's release schedules. Yeah. We've got Paperback Writer. What have you got? Oh, we got Paint It Black. All right, you go now and we'll go in six weeks. And they would stagger, in, in the UK anyway, they would stagger the releases of new singles so as not to go head to head. It was like both bands could assume, well, we'll have the charts for a month or six weeks before these other guys come back with their counter to our single. And they just went back and forth for years. And I would bet the farm that that's exactly what McCartney was thinking with this one. Yeah, that makes um, sense. You know, he played on this Stones record. The Stones were, were billing, letting the world know they had new music coming for months. And then at some point, you know, McCartney looked and said, well, when are you putting that out? Okay, well, I'll wait. <laughs> right? I, I mean, mean it's, you can't have ahead. the Beatles and the Stones going head to head now for the first time. <laughs> so it's just fascinating to think that the Rolling Stones just had a great six or eight week campaign that led <laughs> to the, you know, the release of the Gaga single was yeah. great. Angry was great. The videos and then the album universally acclaimed as a great Stones album. And then it's like, okay, now it's November. 
and here come the Fab Four. And like you said earlier, Zepp, you know, McCartney was like, oh, you guys go first. But, <laughs> no, you guys take it. Go right ahead. I'm yeah. going to wait. And when, you, when, when everyone's got their fill of the Stones, then we'll come out and remind everybody that the Stones are the Stones and the Beatles are the Beatles. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, no matter what you think of that Beatles song right there, realizing that it was never, who knows it was, if it was ever going to be released with John Lennon if he had remained alive and got back together with the guys, which he most certainly probably would have to do more recording. That Side, you just described something that literally has not happened in over 50 years. An event of the Rolling Stones and the Beatles controlling yeah. the new music vibe and uh, it, it just flow of, of that industry. And it just happened again in 2023. That alone is just mind blowing. And the first time I've, I remember experiencing it because I don't recall the 60s. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. No, it's, tr- it's truly true. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I've had this thought before. Um, I, I saw the Stones in 2021 uh, in Atlanta and during the gig, and I've seen the Stones a bunch of times, but at that gig specifically, it was the first one without Charlie Watts, and I was watching the band, and as they would start another song, I would think like, oh, wait, that's... That's them. Those are the same people that wrote this song and recorded that <laughs> yeah. song and put it yeah. out 41 years ago. Yeah. You know, like when, when they went into Tumbling Dice, it, it really, I, I was overcome with emotion. I was like, that's still, that's those guys. That's these people right there. Um, I, I know I've spent time with Ringo Starr, and, and when I've done that in the past and we've hung out, it's like... In the moment, you're just looking at an older guy who's really spry and tells great stories, and it's really cool. And at some point, every time I've ever been with him, I'll go, "Oh, this this is the same guy." Yeah, that's not. This is not the actor playing an older Ringo Starr. This is the same dude, right. the real Beetle. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 in, poke him. in uh in Phil- in in 2019 in Philadelphia, I I spent like 30 minutes with him in his dressing room before a show. And he was telling stories, and he kept saying, "Goes well." The first time we come over, and when we were on the plane, and we, and he kept saying "we," <laughs> and I was, and then I was going, "When he says we, he means the Beatles." Yeah, right. like, yeah. like, yeah. Well, like, wait a minute, no, you mean you mean when they, yeah. or when y'all? I mean, he's like, right. well, and we, we were excited to get to the states, you know. And I'm just like, we, <laughs> holy smokes, oh. you know the um. It really is something. Your early experiences in life w- do inform how you operate the rest of your life. The Beatles recorded their first album in one day. <laughs> in 1963, they recorded Please Please Me in a day. Yeah. Like, literally. Like, well, mm-hmm. we've got to do 14 tracks. Well, we better get started. <laughs> and and go put on the album Please yeah. Please Me. It's great. I mean, yeah. it's like that's a real great band playing and singing those songs. And they never lacked for work ethic. You know, you again, we mentioned earlier, you were watching Get Back last night, Zep. You put it on just to watch. Yeah. And the, these are guys, that, the thing that blows my mind, Get Back, the Beatles in a studio filming it for what they thought was going to be a big TV special. Those sessions commenced six weeks after the White Album was released. Yeah. Not six months or not a year but the White Album came out in November, and the first week of January, they're like, go to get back in the studio and make a new record. I mean, it's incredible. Peter Jackson gives you that incredible shot of the calendar on the weekend that they're going to perform and record this album at the same time with 14 original songs. And you look at the calendar, and they have approximately two weeks yeah, right. to do that, to write, rehearse, yep. put the songs together, and get it ready for a stage performance and a recording. It's it's really mind-boggling. They didn't get that done, of course, uh, that particular time, but mind-boggling. And when they put those 14 songs together back in those days, they wouldn't use the singles that were released. I remember uh, George thinking or saying one time in a documentary, saying, Oh, no, we wouldn't put the, you know, as you would do, you crank out a couple of singles. Well, you're gonna, that's going to be part of the 14 songs that you put the album together. No, he thought that that was a little lazy for the fans. Yeah, they did. Uh, <laughs> they had a six-year run where every year they released two albums and four singles. Wow. And so four singles is is eight songs. Yeah. Two albums, 14 songs each. So that's 28 plus eight, 36 songs a year for six straight years, oh and every single song on that list we we all know. Yeah, true. Yeah, that, there, there's there's tons of songs by. I mean, hell, I know people that don't know all of Led Zeppelin's catalog, and that's eight albums. You know, you can put on stuff from In Through the Outdoor, and people are like, what is this? 
or Presence, their last two albums. There's a lot of those songs people just never got around to. We know every one of the Beatles' 9 billion songs. Pretty incredible. And again, in case you're just joining us, a new one released today, the last single, uh, Now and Then. You'll be hearing it a lot over the next few days. That much is for sure. And as long as we're looking back, let's uh, let's look back and learn something. How about history lesson? Well, I appreciate a guy who knows his history. Well, you've come to the right place. Steve, what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> Uh, let's see. It is November the 2nd, and on this day, 33 years ago, the Minnesota Timberwolves, for the first time ever, tipped off in a regular season basketball game at the Target Center. They played the Dallas Mavericks, 98-85. to Victors, Tony Campbell led the way with 24 points. Who, baby? <laughs> uh, if you say so. <laughs> yeah. Tony, Tony, Campbell. Tony Campbell, who was was on that last Lakers championship team in 88. Oh, yeah. Now he I was, recall. He was on the that bench Tony for the Campbell. Lakers. Yeah. He's the only player. He was in the <laughs> Continental Basketball Association when that season started, <laughs> and his team won the title, and then he got to the Lakers and won an NBA title. The only guy to win a CBA and NBA title in the same season. How about mm. that? Yeah. And then showed up here. And had a pretty good run as a Timberwolf. And then a few years after that, two years later, they drafted Christian Leitner and then all hell broke loose. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, these things happen. The KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS.